everybody. I'm Jared. And I'm Jordan. And this is episode four of the I Think It's Time podcast. Today, we speak with Professor Gretchen Soren, who is the director and distinguished professor of the Cooperstown Graduate Program. She is also the author of a new book called Driving While Black, which examines how the automobile fundamentally changed black life. We sit down to speak with her about the painful history of slavery and segregation, the importance of the automobile to the civil rights movement, and how travel can help to combat prejudice. So thanks for watching, and make sure you subscribe. All right. Uh, so Professor Gretchen Soren, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so we read your most recent book, uh, Driving While Black, um, and uh, I, I bought the book all the way back in 2020 when you had first released it. And I was reading it and about halfway through, I looked at uh, the name Gretchen Soren. I, I looked you up on Google and I realized that you lived right down the road from us here in upstate New York. Uh, and that sort of made me happy. And, and I told Jordan that uh, we had to reach out to you uh, to get you on this, this podcast. And uh, we reached out and we're grateful that you accepted. Uh, so I guess if you just want to begin by uh, telling people a little bit about who you are, uh, your research, and uh, your most recent book, Driving While Black. Uh, well, my name is Gretchen Soren. I am a professor at the State University of New York at Oneonta, um, and I am the director of the Cooperstown Graduate Program, which is a museum studies training program. We train people who are going to work in museums. Um, and my research has been on um, African-American mobility and travel. And I guess um, when, I, when I started this research, um, I had, a friend of mine had handed me the cover of a little guidebook called the Negro Motorist Green Book. And it was probably 20 years ago. And I had never heard of this green book. And as someone who had studied African-American history, I was very surprised that I knew nothing about it. Um, and so I was determined to figure out a little more about it. So I, I started out with the Green Book um, and started researching um, travel for African-Americans. And that led me to a study of the automobile. And while there are many books written about the importance of the automobile in American life, there were no books that I found that addressed the importance of the automobile for African-Americans. And mm -hmm. what I discovered was that the automobile made um, safe travel possible for African Americans um, and travel that was not humiliating. And that's really mm -hmm. what led me to write Driving While Black, African American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. Yeah. Very, very good book. Interesting book. Thank um, you. And you take such a unique perspective because you don't see many books written specifically about the automobile mm -hmm. and the black experience in America. Um, but in the book you say, and I'm going to quote you, you say for white Americans, freedom of movement has always been a fundamental right. Uh, and you give countless examples of how for black Americans, restriction of movement was normalized from the very beginning. And um, particularly when we when we think about the first uh, Africans who were transported to the colonies through the Middle Passage on slave ships and the fugitive slave laws, the slave patrols, and the list just goes on. Um, so could you talk about the history of black restriction of mobility starting sort of from the, the very beginning? Absolutely. You know, if you if you look at the article articles of confederation that come before the Constitution, mm -hmm realize that in the Articles of Confederation, they talk about the importance of the freedom of movement um, for Americans. This is part of um, what is going to make American liberty, um, what is going to constitute American liberty. liberty. Um, in the 18th century, for white Americans, that was assumed. It was, it was so much a part of American liberty that it was not put into the Constitution. It was just assumed. But for African Americans, there were restrictions placed on them, on us, as soon as we stepped ashore. So from the very beginning, um, that the first enslaved person stepped on the shores of the New World, um, you had to have passes to travel. You could not travel freely without a pass. If you were found 
um, to be out without a pass, you could be beaten or you could be incarcerated. So American mobility was really only free for for white Americans. Um, yeah. If you you had to have either a paper pass, and in, in some areas like Charleston, there were little tags that you had to wear if you were permitted by your master, your owner, to be away from his property. So those restrictions carried on right through the Jim Crow period. We see, you know, after the even after the Civil War, we see African Americans being restricted to not uh, not only the plantations but to sharecropping. Um, when the Great Migration comes and African Americans are trying to flee from the South, you find that people were patrolling the bus stations and patrolling the train stations to prevent the workforce from leaving. So even then, their movements were restricted. And if you follow that even up to the present, and you think about Ahmad Aubrey, for example, you know he was perceived of being in the wrong neighborhood, a place he was not supposed to be. His his mobility was restricted, right? People, those those men that murdered him didn't think he should be um, in that neighborhood, in their neighborhood. And that was very true for African-Americans all over the United States. It's, it's still true today that African-Americans are perceived as not belonging in certain places. Mm. Mm. I want to take one of your classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you break everything down so uh, well, and I, we also watched your documentary. Oh yeah. Um, oh good. And it 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 was just a, it just brought to life the book that much more for me. Like yes, it was so so clear. You know why, how important the automobile was. Yep. You know it really really illuminated that for us. So oh yeah, and we'll get we'll get to it in a little bit, but. You said you had never really learned of the Green Book before you, uh, you know, got into the the research behind this book. Is that what you said? Yes. Um, yeah. The Green Book. You know, I don't think very many people were um, were aware of the Green Book. You know, twenty mm-hmm. years ago, yeah. um, a lot of people didn't know about it. People didn't know about it until the Hollywood movie. Mm. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, I'm I'm convinced that. When Victor Green died, Victor Green died in 1960. And I'm sure mm. that people took their green books after the civil rights legislation was passed and they threw them away. They were so glad that, you know, segregation was over that they threw them away. They were made to be thrown away. Victor Green even writes in one of the green books, someday my book will not be needed. He, he says that mm. someday we, this won't be needed. We won't have to do this anymore. So I think that we were just far enough away from the Green Book that um, it that people didn't remember it anymore. Yeah. People weren't thinking about it. But what, what I found fascinating in this research was that while the Green Book was important, there were dozens of these books. There were The Green Book was not the only one. It's the one that's been popularized by a Hollywood movie. But there were dozens and dozens of these African American travel guides, which tells you how ubiquitous this problem was. There was the the Bronze American, the Go Guide, Travel Guide, the Traveler's Guide. There were there were just a wealth of these books that Black people used to negotiate travel um, during the during the period of, of Jim Crow, which would be from the beginning of the automobile when the automobile becomes popular in the 1930s until the 1960s when the civil rights legislation is passed. Yeah. And that's, that's fascinating to me because, you know, throughout all of our schooling and you can speak Mm -hmm. for yourself, but I had never heard of the green book and really I can't, I can't remember ever hearing about other guides either. Um, So I think what your book did for us is sort of, you know, help us learn something new. Um, But uh, another piece of your book um, that uh, really stuck out to me is that, you know, what it shows is that the civil rights movement was more than just Martin Luther King. You know, it was more than just the, the marchers, uh, the Rosa Parkses that have begun, become sort of symbolic of the civil rights movement. 
Um, you know, what you state in your book is that it was much broader. Um, even the, the simple act of driving alone was an act of resistance. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and, and I, you yeah. know, it's so interesting because so many scholars have condemned the black middle class and said, well, you know, the black middle class didn't do much. And I think that's absolutely wrong. I think the black mm. middle class was doing something every single day when they got into their automobiles and they defied, you know, the, the, the segregated buses and the segregated trains. And when they said, we're going to go on vacation and they went to places all over the country. And that was, that was a dangerous thing to do. You absolutely yeah. never knew what you were going to encounter out there on the road, but they did it. Um, you yeah. know, and they, they went across country, they went to national parks, they went to museums, they took their families um, back home to the South, if they were from, if they were from the South. And I think every time they did it, it was an act of, of defiance. Yeah. And I think the fact that, that we don't think of, of that as sort of a huge contribution to the civil rights movement is because it was an everyday act. It was sort of invisible. Mm -hmm. And one quote that you write in your book is that black travelers could starve the racist public transportation system by driving their own cars. Right. And that just stuck with me. Like you, you know, that act alone, it, it doesn't, you know, one person, it, it, it takes thousands of people, you know, to, to do that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see the sort of uh, ramifications of that and the dismantling of, of racist systems. So I, I guess a, a broader question for you is, you know, can you talk about, the overall impact that driving an automobile had on the civil rights movement as a whole. Um, I, and I think you stated it very well. Um, <clears throat> I think um, boycotts were a very important aspect of, of civil rights, right? You know, you boycott a product. If uh, African-Americans decided tomorrow that they wanted to boycott a particular product, um, it would have an impact on that manufacturer and they would, they might change their, they might change their ways. We see this in Philadelphia with Tasty Cake, right? Tasty Cake wouldn't mm. allow people to work in their factories. Um, and then uh, in Philadelphia, which is a black city, right? So they boycott Tasty Cake. And lo and behold, mm. they decide they're going to let people work in their factories. But I think for the civil rights movement, you could not have had the civil rights movement without the automobile. Mm. For one thing, <clears throat> when you went to... The airport. So let's say Martin Luther King or Ralph Abernathy or any of the leaders of the movement, when they flew into a city, a southern city, there was absolutely no way for them to get from the airport to their black hotel because the only contracts that were written for cab companies at airports were for white cab companies. Black cab companies mm -hmm. could not pick people up at, um, at the airport. And of course, those cab companies were cab, cab companies were segregated. And so you could fly into an airport and you were stuck at the airport because you couldn't get to your hotel. Rental cars made it possible for those civil rights workers to get to their black hotels, to get to the black neighborhoods, to get to the black churches where the, where the meetings were held. <clears throat> so that's one reason the automobile was so important. But another reason the automobile was so important was because of those boycotts. All over the all over the South, it enabled bus boycotts. So you could boycott bus systems by refusing to ride the buses. And that's what happens in Montgomery. They buy a fleet of cars. They literally bought um, a fleet of automobiles and they use those automobiles to drive people to work so they didn't have to take the buses to work. What they were yeah. able to do was to cut the revenue of the bus company by 69%. Wow. That ultimately ended up putting the bus company out of business. So mm -hmm. those boycotts work. Um, and I think it's, it's a good lesson for us. Um, and it was just a fleet of cars that did it. So it was really automobiles that made it possible to, um, uh, for the civil rights movement to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And given that, um, you know, this episode will be released on Martin Luther King Day this year. Uh, I just wanted to point out a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that you included in your book. So um, in his 1963 letter 
from Birmingham jail. Uh, He writes, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Uh, He goes on to say, I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. And then uh, a a little later in the letter, he writes, when you take a cross country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile, because no motel will accept you when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs, reading white and colored, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. So I wanted to make sure to mention that quote, um, because it shows that not even Dr. Martin Luther King Jr was immune to the humiliation of segregation. Uh, And yeah, I mean, it points directly towards what you talk about in your book. Um, So do you have any thoughts on, on some of the things Dr. King mentioned in his letter? Well, and I, you know, I think um, it also was perpetuated because what Mm. happened was that African-Americans would bring their children onto these buses and bring their children onto these trains. So this was just perpetuating the humiliation and also perpetuating this idea of inferiority, right? When you when you get on a train or you get on a bus that's segregated and you're told to sit in the back, and you're told that over and over again, you're told that you are inferior. You become inferior. You know, you yeah. begin to believe that you're inferior. So this wasn't just for that generation but for generations to come, right? For, for all of those children who were subjected to all of that humiliation day in and day out. Um, and, and in the period of segregation, not only was it sitting in the back of the bus, but it was being taunted and having people use the N word and call you names when you got on the bus. So it wasn't, it wasn't simply, you know, riding in the Negro car or riding at the back of the bus. But it was being it was being constantly humiliated by the white people that were on the bus or the white people that were mm-hmm. on the um, getting on the train. So, you know, you can imagine what an environment that was um, for for African-Americans. Yeah. So thinking about the automobile, you know, in particular in your book, one of the aha moments for me uh, was when you were explaining the types of cars that the black families <laughs> would buy um, during the the Jim Crow days, and and you write that uh, the calculus was just different for black families than it was for white families. Um, you know, whereas white families would would look for more compact cars uh, that sort of symbolize their wealth and status, um, black families had to uh, look for a safe car. Right. Um, and, and sort of think about the factors of, you know, would it be comfortable to sleep in? You know, was it sturdy and strong enough to to get away from a, a mob ambush? You right. know, those sort of pra- practical questions that uh, white families just didn't have to, to think about. Um, so can you speak about that, that calculus that black families had to face? Well, and, you know, that was an aha moment for me, too, when I when I thought about the kinds of vehicles that my parents bought and when I thought about the reasons that black families bought mm-hmm. the cars that they did. So you really had to worry about whether or not your car would be easy to turn over. So if you encountered a mob, would your car be heavy enough so it would be hard for a mob to turn your car over, to rock mm-hmm. it and turn it over? You had also to carry so much gear with you when you traveled. You you know, when I was a kid um, and we would have my grandmother in the car. My grandmother was born in the very late 19th century. You know, so she was really, uh, she was really a woman of the early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, and she always wanted to carry a big coffee can in the car that was for, to pee in if you needed to stop. And my brother and I were horrified at that. Why would we carry, Nana, why would we carry a pee can in the car? Now I understand. Mm. You know, that was the, the wake up moment for me that that had been her experience that you always needed to carry your own can in the car because you couldn't go to the bathroom at a gas station. You couldn't stop um, at a gas station. So you, you had to carry a pee can. You had to carry your own food because you didn't know if you could stop at a restaurant. So you would often carry a cooler. Sometimes people would carry two days worth of food in that car. If you had to go from say New York or Chicago to Florida, 
um, and you didn't know where you could stop, you might carry two days worth of food in that cooler. Mm -hmm. So you had to have a car that was big and heavy and could carry that cooler, and that pecan, and you might carry a, a gallon or two of gas because you didn't know where you could get gas. And you would carry mm -hmm. blankets and pillows because you might have to sleep in the car. So your, your car becomes almost like a rolling living room um, because mm -hmm. you've got to carry all of those things that if you were white, you could just stop by the side of the yeah. road and, you know, go to a restaurant, go to a hotel, uh, stop off at a little shop, go to a gas station. But for African-Americans, this is a, you know, this is a, a trip into the unknown. You have no way of knowing, except for these guidebooks, you have no way of knowing where you can stop, who's going to welcome you, who's going to, what little towns are going to be dangerous. Yeah. And, and that was such a well uh, stated point in the book. Very, very illuminating for me um, when I, when I read that, because um, a lot of times when we were young uh, and I know we're not, we're not too far removed from, from our childhood, but um, I recall in the early two thousands, um, our own father would take us on trips each year to visit our family in Virginia. So we would take the 10 hour drive um, from upstate New York to Virginia. Um, and again, this is in the early 2000s. And I remember every single time we would leave either late, late at night or early, early in the morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I never understood why, you know, I, we would pack pillows. Like you, like you mentioned your own um, family packed a lot of stuff. We would pack a lot of food so we didn't have to stop. Um, and I always thought that the main reason of leaving at certain times was to beat the traffic. You know, that's what I was told. That's what and the say. reason we packed. Right. And the reason that we packed a lot of food was to avoid spending money at the rest stops. But when I was reading the parts of your book, when you talk about this, um, it just, it, something clicked in my head where it's like, is this a remnant from, the past, you know what I mean? Like, yes. How do these historical practices of preparations and planning shape the way black families take long road trips today or the, you know, how did they shape the, the trips that our own father took with us? And it's, it's funny that you say that because I was doing a, a program um, with a, another, with an African-American woman and she was telling me the same thing. And mm. we were talking about how, for many black families, this has become normalized behavior. So yeah. even though perhaps you can stop now at restaurants or perhaps you can stop at a hotel, it's become normal behavior for black families to get up in the middle of the night to start driving <laughs> at night. African-American families often drove at night because at night it's harder to see who's in the car, right? So if you mm. don't want people to see who's in the car to be able to see, if you don't want police in small towns to be able to see who's in the car or to be less likely to be able to see who's in the car, you drive at night. <clears throat> and that is, you know, has become tradition. It's become part of African-American life to carry that food with you, to carry those blankets and pillows. But still, there are people that still are a little bit hesitant, are a little bit uncomfortable. They don't know, you know, if you're driving, what, what, what small towns might you be able to drive into, even in upstate New York? You know, yep. are there ta yep. are there places that would be a little bit scary if you broke down, if your car broke down in, in this little town or that little town? So I think there are certainly vestiges of this behavior that remain with us. Um, and I, I do think there are places in this country, obviously, um, that it's that it is still dangerous to um, be. in. I know that the NAAC, NAACP issued its very first um, warning about a state, about Missouri, yep. um, about driving in Missouri. So, and, and we do know that there are, um, there are some very good police departments in this country and there are some very bad police departments in this country. And, you know, you don't want to be caught in one of those towns with one of those bad and dangerous police departments. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I think that, you know, at the end of your book, you did a great job of, of uh, speaking about uh, some of those 
modern examples, um, the, the federal probe into Ferguson, um, you know, the Louisiana situation. So that was really interesting. But um, throughout the book, you do a great job of providing historical example after historical example uh, of the dangers of driving while black. Um, and one example that you use that uh, sort of made me furious inside because I hadn't known about this individual uh, was the incident of Willie Edwards, um, who in 1957 was driving as a grocery delivery driver uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, and he was confronted by a group of white Klansmen uh, who made an accusation against him uh, and then killed him. Uh, and, you know, you can get into detail about that incident if you'd like. But, um, you know, I, I think that you know, looking at that incident of Willie Edwards in 1957, and then comparing it to the incident that uh, you referenced earlier on about Ahmad Aubrey, um, and thinking that you know those incidents are sort of 60 years apart, uh, but are are very similar in, in you know many respects. So I guess you know just uh, you know you can talk about Willie Edwards, but thinking about you know, Willie Edwards to today, how far have we come? Right. And, and where are those places? You know, it's, it's still about mobility, right? It's still about whether or not there are, mm -hmm. are safe space is are, are places in the United States safe for everyone. You know, mm -hmm. everyone should be able to go to any town, any city um, in the United States, but are those places safe um, for yeah. African-Americans? And you have to wonder um, whether or not those places are safe, whether it is safe to take your automobile and go where you want to go when you want to go. Um, <clears throat> there were in the 1940s and 50s, hundreds and hundreds of sundown towns in this country um, that excluded African-Americans um, and or, or that allowed African-Americans to work. So you could be a gardener or you could be a butler or you could be a chauffeur in those towns, as long as you were out of town by sundown. Um, and there were even a couple of towns that had sirens that would go off at six o'clock, which basically said, if you're black and you hear the siren go off, get out of town. Hmm. Um, and one of the stories that I told was of Thurgood Marshall standing on a train platform and being accosted. And, um, you know, a man says to him, you, you better be out, you better get out of this town because the sun is never set on a nigger in this town. Um, and that was in Shreve. He was on his way to Shreveport, Louisiana. So the question is, are there still places that are not safe? Are there, is, are there still places that it's not safe for African-Americans to be, um, to go? And I think the answer yeah. sadly is yes. There are places mm -hmm. that it's not safe to go. The problem is you don't always know what those places are. Yep. And, I, and just one more point about yeah. Ahmad Aubrey. I know we just, you know, recently saw the a little bit of justice in that case, you know, the, the sentencing of, of those three men to life in prison, whereas we didn't see that with, with Willie Edwards. So there is a little, you know, that change. But as you state, there are still thousands of places uh, throughout the, the country uh, where, you know, it's not safe for, for black people to live. And Ahmaud um, Aubrey is still dead. I mean, it's not exactly, you know, it, that's the, that's the really sad, um, really sad part. Yeah. It, uh, the point you just made about, you don't know certain, you, you don't know if it's safe to be in certain places or not. Like Ahmad Arbery, I'm sure he thought he was safe, you know, strolling just through where he, was, where he was walking. He was just jogging. And I think to myself, like when I'm out jogging in, in rural white areas and I pass by a, any, any white individual, um, part of me tries to maybe smile extra, extra wide, maybe, appear as less threatening as I possibly can. But the fact that like, if I'm out jogging and I'm wearing my hood, I think to put my hood down, um, 
smile, let them know I'm not threatening because you just never know. You know, they, you don't know if they see you as just a, a regular stereotype, you know, stereotypical black young man. You know what I mean? So it's kind of just this always um, heightened anxiety when you're moving, you know, whether it's running, walking, riding a bike, uh, and riding in a car and kind of to go off of that. Um, I think going off of our trips with our, with our dad and the family trips, being in the car for 10 hours, if not longer at times, if you're making a few stops, you kind of always knew the risk, even if it wasn't explicit, you knew that it was a, it was a heightened risk of just being in a car. You, you have a, a higher chance of passing more police officers, uh, maybe a higher chance of speeding and not realizing you're speeding. Um, maybe you have a, a towel light blinker that's out. I don't know, but there's just a higher chance of, of being stopped by the police. So um, I remember on multiple occasions being a little kid and our dad would be stopped by the police and we would kind of just, I, I, don't, I, I don't know about you, but I would see his interactions with the officers and that power dynamic, um, you know, how the officer has a gun, they have the power to take a life, they have the power to arrest him, or they have the power to just give him a ticket and let him go. Uh, but as a kid, just witnessing this, you're, you're sort of aware inherently of all of these different options and the power dynamic at play. So uh, my question for you is, could you talk about the interaction between law enforcement and black drivers and the impact, as you mentioned, that this has had on generations, you know? You know, when I started looking at the uh, contemporary issues, um, yeah. it, it was, it, it's, it's very overwhelming. Um, there are more than 17,000 police departments in the United States. And mm. those police departments are all independent. There's no like overarching police authority. You know, there's the state mm. troopers, there's the New York City police, there's the Cooperstown police, the Oneonta police, the Utica police, and they're all independent. They're, none of them are <clears throat> linked in any way by any overarching authority in any way. And the training for police departments is totally different. It's whatever the, the community decides and whatever they can afford. So, you know, they may require, you know, the, I don't know if the state troopers require college some college, or if you just have to have a high school diploma, if you have to have, you know, months of training or weeks of training, but they give you a gun and the mm -hmm. training is variable. So some places there is a great deal of training. Other places, there's not very much training at all. Um, yeah. There are some training videos that are used with police that only use people of color as the perps. So literally, when you're a police officer and you're learning to be a police officer, you're learning to be trained, and you're watching these videos about various aspects of police work, they're showing you perpetrators, they're all people of color. And that's something that, um, there, there, you know, there's been quite a uh, hue and cry against, because what are you doing? You're, you know, you're putting into the heads of the police officers that perpetrators are always people of color, right? When you mm, show them yeah. only training videos that use people of color. But that power dynamic is very strong. And I think that's one of the reasons that African-Americans often traveled at night because it was more difficult to determine who was in the car at night. Mm. Um, when the police officer stops you, um, it's it's something that African African-Americans, and I'm sure your parents, had this conversation with you, um, the thing that people find most shocking is that every African-American parent sits down with their child when they become old enough to drive and has the talk. And the talk is how you behave when you're stopped by the police. Um, one of the things that the attempt is to keep your child safe, right? You want to keep your child safe so that if the police stop your child who's driving, they are less likely to shoot and, and murder your child. 
Um, of course, Craig Wilder in the in the documentary Driving While Black says, you know, but but you have no way of really keeping your child safe because you don't know mm-hmm. who that police officer is. You don't know yeah. if that police officer is going to shoot first and ask questions later. Um, and we've seen so many young African-Americans shot by police or, or even when they're running away. You know, why would you shoot somebody that's running away? from you that's no threat to you right they're they're mm-hmm. they're trying to get away from you they're, so you catch them later if they're if they're uh, if they've done something wrong you don't you don't yeah. shoot them down i think police are not trained well to de-escalate situations right the the goal of a policeman should be if there's a situation that's escalating to de-escalate that situation not to escalate that situation but what we have are situations, as we, we see them on the videos all the time, that the policemen themselves are escalating the situation. They make the situation more hostile, more intense, and they end up getting into you know, some sort of a struggle, and then they shoot to kill the person. Or, or the policeman yeah. is afraid. That's the other thing, uh, I think, mm. is that police are often afraid of African Americans. And they believe the stereotypes about African Americans, and so they're mm-hmm. much more um, trigger happy. Yeah. The when I when I spoke with um, the the chief from Montreal, he said that if a policeman approaches your window, right, and and they think they're in danger then they shouldn't approach your window. They should stay back, right? They should call for backup. They should um, have you get out of the car. They should have you put your hands out the window, something. But they shouldn't go up to your window and then shoot into the car, as has been done in the past, because they're afraid, right? It's about them. It's not about you. It's about them. They're afraid. So if they're afraid, they've they've made a mistake and they've taken your life because of their mistake. Yeah. And, and f- yeah. No, I was going to say Philando Castile comes to mind when you, exactly. when you mentioned that. Yeah. Um, just a fear, fear-based response where, and then you can hear afterwards, I didn't mean to, I didn't, you know what I mean? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't, you brought up the the chief of the Montreal uh, police. I'm not, I'm not sure if this was, in discussion with him, but in your book, you, you talk about the acronym cop, you know, constable on patrol. Um, and you know, I, I, you, I'm wondering how large of an impact did the automobile have on policing? You know, where, Huge. you know, yeah. I, you know, I think, um, what he talked about the fact that <clears throat> when, when police got into cars, first of all, they went constable on patrol, when they walked a beat, they knew more about the people that lived in the neighborhood. Mm. You know, they knew who mm. was in each house. They knew who was in each store. They spoke to people. They got to know people. Um, it, w- it was different. It was a different time, different world. When policemen get into cars and they roll up the windows, you know, because it's cold out or because it's hot out, that's another barrier between the police and their neighborhood, their community. A lot of people, a lot of police don't live in their communities anymore, right? So you have people coming into the community who don't live there and who don't, um, who just come in to be law enforcement in that community. So they don't really know who the people are that live in that community. That's not a good situation, but the automobile becomes a, a barrier between policemen and their community. Because they're protecting yeah. themselves from the weather, as well as covering a lot larger territory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you want to talk about the, the police car? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were talking earlier, and I, um, <laughs> I always, when I see a police car driving by, it doesn't look like a friendly car to me. And we were talking about the different types of cars before and, and specifically uh, the choice that black families 
had or even white families on what car, what specific car they were going to buy. But when I'm passing by a police car, and I know the models have changed throughout the years, I personally think it looks like a shark. I don't, I could be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I could be crazy, but like, I, I know I there's different mean. types. There's, yeah, there's cars, there's um, SUVs or, or whatever, all types. But it's like, <laughs> To me, it looks like a shark, and every time it's like I have to have to watch out that it doesn't loop back around. Not out of fear that I, you know, that I'm a, a half black, half white man, but just because what it something could be wrong. My my light could be out or something. It's that's just how I feel. What is your what are your some of your thoughts on? You know, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that. that. I I could see how the <clears throat> how the uh, design on the side of police cars could make them look. Um, yeah, shark like. I think um, <laughs> police dogs. You know the German shepherds. I think mm. that contributes to the kind of uh, adversarial appearance mm. of uh, some some police officers, as well as all of that stuff that they are wearing. I yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Um, yeah. And even being on a campus where there are campus police, they're real police, and they also have. You know the mace, the stick, the uh, what is that? The the, the, the gun, yeah, yeah, the baton. Yeah, I, I, you know, we have in in many ways we've militarized our police, mm. uh, and I understand the the danger that police face every day. I get it. I know it's a mm. dangerous job, um, and I know police are killed, um, but I will say. Police actually kill more people than police are killed every year. Mm. Um, And that is a statistic that is very accurate. Um, But we have militarized the police and we've given them um, surplus military equipment, tanks and, you know, these kind of armored vehicles. And it we have given them the appearance of a military force. Um, So I think you're Mm. right in that, you know, know, when you're saying they, it looks like a shark, I think we have given the police the appearance of, of a military force. Yeah. Yeah. Just real quick. I, at the very, very end of your book, you say that police departments need to embrace a guardian mindset rather than a warrior mindset. But you, you do point out, there are instances where they need a warrior mindset, sure. which we all know is true. They're the police. They serve and protect the people. Um, but, you know, you you do make it a point to note that they should approach the community as a guardian. And I think 2020 was a was a big year um, in just just getting people to realize that. When I was talking to the chief in in Montreal, he said that, you know, if, if this much is, we, we look at people as if it, this much is law breaking and this much is guardian when really it's this much, it's, it's guardian and, and this much is law breaking. Mm. And, you know, a broken taillight is not a, a big deal. You know, it's, that's, this is not a huge criminal offense. It's probably an accident, you know, it's, yeah. so, or, 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 it, or an air freshener in the case of, uh, right. uh what, yeah, the recent case of Dante Wright. Right, exactly. An air freshener hanging from the mirror. Um, I understand that for police, that's that's the low hanging fruit, right? Mm. They like to address the the low hanging fruit. I understand why, you know, they stop people and give them tickets for that that low hanging fruit. Things that we think are no big deal, but yeah. that's also part of this, you know, um, guardian versus military mindset you know catching bad guys everybody is not a bad guy everybody is not a lawbreaker and we want the public safety should be the goal not you know catching as many people as we possibly can in our mm-hmm. net but but public safety keeping our communities safe and what yep. is it, it seems to me that if if we had people whose responsibility was traffic enforcement, right? Or if we electronically gave tickets for running red lights, running stop signs, um, you know, the things that are, that are dangerous, um, speeding, 
if those were if those tickets were given out electronically, that would free up the police to do those things mm. that are really important and dangerous. I've never heard of that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's really a good point. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, so and, I have... they're experimenting with that. It's, California's got an experiment going on. There are a couple of other states. You know hmm. how um, they've gotten rid of all the tolls in New York? Have you noticed that? Oh, boy. I, I've gotten a few in the mail. I got to still pay. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't they do the same thing for speeding? Why can't they do the same thing for running a red light? Why can't mm. they do the same thing for running a stop sign? Electro- we can do all of those things electronically. We don't yeah. need. Wow. Uh, and that way, police do not have to stop people. Um, and even, you know, po- possibly stop dangerous people. For And it's probably more, it's probably more accurate, you know, you electronically. Right. So you, there's no question whether or not you sped or you went through the red light. It's on camera, you yeah. know. And right. Can show you. Exactly. Exactly. So mm. then that frees up the police for doing those things that they really need to be worrying about. We enabled, mm. the, we, we gave traffic enforcement to the police. When automobiles mm. came into existence, we said, oh, well, we've got to figure out how to handle this, right? We've got to figure out how to handle um, people that run stop signs and people that run red lights. Okay. And we, we gave that to the police. Should we have given it to the police or should we have had a separate uh, traffic enforcement group mm. of some sort? Um, it's it's certainly possible to restructure policing. Yeah. And as we have seen, there are, you know, how do we handle mental illness? There are so many things that the police officers are not prepared to do. They're not prepared to handle the mentally ill. They're not yeah. prepared to handle the homeless. They're not necessarily prepared to handle traffic enforcement. Do because because they don't necessarily need to. Their training is for other in other areas. So why not let them handle those things that are really dangerous, that are really important for the police, for law enforcement, and find yeah. other ways of handling some of these other problems. Yeah, that's a very good Spot point. On. Yeah, <laughs> very good. So I have a a large question for you. Um, so I I think we're you know, just thinking, you know, broadly, we're at a very unique moment in history, I think, um, as it, you know, when it comes to race and, and racial justice, you know, we, we just went from witnessing the election of uh, Barack Obama, uh, you know, and then went to Donald Trump. Uh, and now, uh, you know, we have the, the first woman, black woman vice president uh, in Kamala Harris. Uh, and then obviously, as Jordan had mentioned, the incident of George Floyd in 2020, uh, you know, caused a, a racial reckoning throughout the country and, and throughout the world. Um, but, uh, you know, where do you think we're headed next? Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface it by, by giving you another MLK quote, um, which sort of has always kept me optimistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King uh, says that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Um, you know, and, and, you know, some people say that uh, as a country, we are digressing, um, but, you know, I, I'm optimistic. I think that, you know, we're ebbing and flowing, but, you know, generally we're we're bending towards justice. But what are, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think we bend toward justice if we bend it. <laughs> you know, if we, <laughs> I, I, I don't think it bends toward justice on its own. I think we have <laughs> to bend it. Um, I, I see some... Um, I see some progress. I see some um, institutions really waking up and they're they're starting to Mm. say, oh, you know, maybe we really need to diversify. Maybe we need to hire people of color. Maybe we need to need to have more people of color working in our in our company, in our factory, in our university. I think there are some places that really have been changed by George Floyd's murder. And then I think there are reactionary people in this country who feel that in the last four years, it's okay. They've been enabled to 
use the N word, to call people names, to go uh, into character assassination, to be incredibly racist. You know, I think um, we're at a time when it's almost become acceptable in some areas, some parts of our country to behave in, I mean, white supremacy is on the rise, right? In certain, in certain places. So I, I think you've got some people who are, who've kind of figured it out and have said, you know, we are a stronger country. We are a better country when we all work together and we understand that um, our multicultural nature is a good thing. And then we've got other people who are, um, you know, reactionary and are saying, um, you know, it's okay to assassinate people's character, to call people names, to attack uh, people. And it's just political correctness to, uh, you know, to be decent to all human beings. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I'm somewhat optimistic because I think Barack Obama had said something that I, that I think is very important. And he says, it's always, you know, it's, it's history and progress doesn't happen in a straight line. You know, it's two steps forward, two steps backward, one step forward, two steps back, one step forward. So, you know, it's, you know, it's more like this (laughs) than it is a, than it is a straight line. Um, It's up and down and we have to be aware that there will be some progress and that there will be some reactionary pushback. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's where I am. (laughs) (laughs) So I have a few more interesting questions for you. Okay. Yeah, cautiously <laughs> optimistic. No, but I like what you said about you have to bend it. Yes. Yeah. You know, it doesn't just happen. And history shows us that, you know, all the, since the days where, where, you know, Africans came on the slave ships, yes. they didn't just, just, just sit, you know, quietly. It's been years and years of bending yes. through the civil rights movement yeah, and still course. today. Yeah. So, um, back to when we were talking about the green book and Victor green, the individual who wrote the green book. Um, my, my question for you is what in your eyes is the importance of travel for all people. And with Victor green in mind, who adopted, as you mentioned in your book, he adopted the phrase travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry and narrow mindedness, which was one of Mark Twain's phrases. Um, and one of Victor green's, main motivations in his work and correct me if I'm wrong, um, was to attempt to convince white people that black people were just like them and to do so via travel. So again, what, what in your eyes is the importance of travel for all people? You know, this is the United States remains an incredibly segregated country. You know, we live in, in very segregated enclaves. There are people that have never I'm, I'm amazed in my graduate program, which is a national program, we get students who have never, I'll ask them in my class, how many of you have had a, a friend who's African-American? And I often get hands, you know, lots of people raising their hands or how many people have never had a friend who was Asian American or Latino or don't, you don't know anybody personally. Mm. And, and often that's the case because a lot of people grow up in communities in the Midwest um, that are completely white and if they've never met a person of color, um, Mm -hmm. and it's, it, at first it shocked me, um, at how segregated, um, the country was. And then you find out, well, the person may have spent, um, a semester abroad, but they spent a semester abroad in Ireland or they spent a semester abroad in London and they still Mm -hmm. have never had a a friend or met a, a colleague who is different from them and these are these are students you're, you're talking about in graduate. entering a graduate program in graduate school. oh wow yes so you know i think um from other parts of the country you know and and mm. having as someone who grew up in new jersey which is probably um i think it's the most diverse state in the united states um you know and knowing people of just about from everywhere you know, when you grow up in Jersey, you know, people from all over the place. Um, I, I had a student a few years ago who said to me, oh, I didn't know bagels were Jewish. <laughs> because th- they thought they were just a kind of bread. You know, they just mm. didn't under they had never met anybody Jewish. Um, and I thought mm. that was really fascinating that you could 
you know, get to that point in your life and really not know very many people that were different from you. But the yeah. thing that travel does, and I, and I mean travel to lots of different places, is that it puts you in contact with people that are different from you. And it, get, it gives you mm-hmm. the opportunity to meet and talk to and understand difference. And I think that's really important. It's something that's important for us to do with our children. It's something that's really important for every American because this is a country that's composed of people from many different backgrounds. Um, the one thing that I love about Utica is <laughs> it's incredible diversity. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a mosque in Utica. You can go to, uh, you can, you can get pierogies at the Ukrainian Catholic church. You, there's, you know, there's so many different people because it's a refugee center um, yeah. And there's so many, so many different people and so many different cultures. That is one of the reasons that we actually do a lot of programs in Utica to get our students okay. um, meeting people and talking to people who are different. So uh, I, I think travel is incredibly important for that reason um, for, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. You can also get some Utica greens. Utica greens. <laughs> Chicken riggies. Chicken riggies. Yes. Oh, <laughs> the best. Not to mention tomato pie. <laughs> oh, oh, tomato yeah. pie. Yeah. Half moons. Is that a Utica thing? Half, Half moon. moon. Yeah. Uh, just throwing another question out to you. Um, I'm wondering, is there a specific example that you have that sort of sticks with you in all of your research? It can be a, you know, a, a past example, it can be a modern example of an, a person or an incident that really resonates with you, you know, re- whether it's the danger of driving while black, you know, anything along those lines. Oh my gosh. There's so many stories. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I guess the story, one of the stories that's very compelling in the book um, is about the the young boy who's traveling. Oh, actually, you know, I have a, I have a story, a wonderful story that is not in the book. That, okay. um, but it 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 could have been, <laughs> and it's about Jackie Robinson, who uh, the famous baseball player, who was yeah. um, going to Florida for um, spring training, and he was bringing his wife Rachel. Um, and his wife, Rachel, told the story. Um, and Rachel and um, Jackie got were going to get on a plane in California. They were going to fly to Florida. And she had on that beautiful white ermine coat that Jackie had bought for her. And Mrs. Robinson, Jackie's mother, showed up at the airport. And she had a shoebox for them. And she handed the shoebox. Now picture Rachel Robinson with her ermine coat on. And Jackie Robinson's um, mother hands her a shoebox full of fried chicken to take on the plane. <laughs> and she doesn't want to embarrass Mrs. Robinson, so she brings that fried chicken on the, on the plane. Um, and they get on the plane and they fly to Texas because, you know, planes did these short, these, these short uh, stints. Um, and they get off in Texas and in Texas, they can't get back on another plane. They won't let them on another plane. So they're stuck really? in Texas and they have to go find the black hotel and mm-hmm. they have to spend the night in Texas and they call branch Ricky and branch Ricky says, well, I'll send a car for you. So mm-hmm. they're, they, they find the black hotel, but there's no place for them to eat. But they had that, shoebox full of fried chicken. <laughs> so that's what they had oh, for dinner yeah. that night. So it turned out that it was a good thing that Mrs. Robinson had given them that box of fried chicken. But it yeah. does make the case that the you know how difficult travel was for African Americans and that even Jackie Robinson couldn't find um mm. could couldn't get he couldn't get on the airplane. Yeah. It was segregated. Wow. Even Andy. though interstate Travel by airplane is governed by um, the federal government. They should have been able mm. to get on a plane. Mm. But Branch Rickey sent a car to continue to drive them to Florida. So you, you know you see how um, how iffy, <laughs> how 
I think uh, travel was for black, how tenuous it was for black Americans and how careful you had to be when you were traveling. Because they could have been completely without dinner that night. Mm -hmm. And I think that story sort of, you know, you, you think about the informal networks that were developed, you know, as you write amongst, you know, black people during that time. And, you know, when you were writing about that in your book, my mind went to Airbnb. And I was thinking that this is the Airbnb before Airbnb, right. you know, where, where black people would open up their homes, you know, a, a spare room to, to other black travelers. Um, but yeah, so that was a really enlightening p- part of your book as well. Yeah. And it was something that um, women could do and make a little extra money for the family mm, was to provide right. a meal and a, and a bed. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, so one of my last questions for you. Um, so I, during college one summer, I served as an intern at the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum, which I'm not sure. Are you aware of? Um, that is it Sarah, where is it? Is it? It's in Peterborough, New York. Oh, yes. OK, I know where it is. Yes. Very, very small museum. But I, I, uh, and I never had any museum experience. This was my first. Uh, this is Garrett first Smith, time right? That summer. Yes, Garrett Smith's home, uh, hometown. Um, so it's sort of like a hidden gem in the area. You know, once once I finished my work there, I was like, why, why does everybody in our area not know about this? But it really made like the 19th century and 20th century reform movements, abolitionists, and events real for me um, instead of mythological. You know, history a lot of times gets mythologized, yes. even to me. And and I kind of, I look back and I'm like, okay, yeah, that happened, but it doesn't really feel like it happened. It, that's in the past. Um, so I know you have a lot of museum experience. Um, this is a, a big part of your, your life. Uh, and on one of your web pages, you say, I believe that museums have a civic responsibility. They are essential learning environments providing visitors with the knowledge to be well-informed citizens who understand the processes of government and have the tools to make thoughtful decisions about community issues. So my question for you is, can you talk about the importance of engaging history with a brutal honesty? Um, And whether this be in museums, libraries, schools, or other segments of our society. You know, I have been so... um stunned by the attitudes that people in this country have about history because Mm -hmm. understanding history, good and bad, um, really makes for a stronger country. It helps us to understand the mistakes we've made as well as the, the good things that have happened. And, you know, the only way our democracy has ever gotten stronger in this country has been through those people that have made the noise, those people that have pushed to force the democracy to be stronger. And they've forced it by pushing for voting rights, pushing for women to be able to vote, pushing for civil rights, pushing for freedom of religion, whatever whatever the cause is, pushing for unions, whatever those causes are, those are the people that have strengthened the democracy because they've brought more people into the democracy. So I don't mm. understand this um, this attitude that talking about um, African American history or women's history or Latino history or Jewish history that these things are wrong. You know, that these are bad things. Or talking about um, the the bad things that have happened that this is um, you know, somehow un-American because I think it's very mm. American. This country is really about. Um, becoming a stronger and stronger, we would hope anyway, it's about becoming a stronger and stronger democracy, not, not uh, becoming more t- totalitarian and uh, censoring ideas. Yeah. So um, I think history, uh, understanding history is very important. If you look even at the current situation, um, if you think about um, epidemics, right? We don't seem to understand the history of epidemics. If you look at polio, the polio vaccine, when when the polio vaccine came out, people were lined up to get that vaccine. 
they were terrified of polio and they could see the ramifications of polio, all these people in iron lungs. And they, they lined up to get this vaccine. The polio vaccine was made with live virus. It mm. really was not tested. I've heard people say, well, you know, those vaccines were well tested. No, they weren't. They were not <laughs> well tested. And they, were, they came out quickly and they were made with live virus. And some people died as a result of those polio vaccines. So people wanted those vaccines because polio was such a dangerous illness. The vaccine today is not made with live virus. It's not mm -hmm. as dangerous as the polio vaccine was in the, you know, in the 1940s so, or 50s. So, you know, understanding epidemics and understanding history really provides a blueprint for understanding the present. Yeah. And that's why I think um, really we should push harder on understanding history and also under, understanding the past helps us understand where we came from and how we got here. And I think that's what Driving While Black does. It helps us to understand how we got to the point we're at today with, with race relations. Um, and mm. I think that's, that's really important. Yeah. And I think the most important piece, as you mentioned, is using history to not repeat the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's utmost priority. And I, and my mind goes to the, uh, insurrection on the Capitol. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, and, and what a, a sort of, you know, sensitive time we're living in where, you know, a few years from now, we may be seeing something like that again. So I think right now, you know, we need to learn from the history that, that just took place. Cause we'll be, we'll be saying January 6th for a long time to come now. <laughs> I know it, it was quite, quite frightening. We've never had anything like that in this country before. Yeah. An attempted, basically it was an attempted coup. Yep. It didn't look real on the news. It didn't register. Now it just seems like it's a part of American history. You know, there's some people that are trying to change it and say, oh, it was a peaceful, exactly. just a peaceful demonstration. Well, it wasn't just a peaceful demonstration. It was very violent, <laughs> dangerous. Yeah. My uh, goodness. Violent act. Yeah. 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 Um, man, those were all my <laughs> questions. Do you have any more? For Let me see here. I think I have one more question, sure. but um, I know that. So, you know, and we may have already talked about this, but the dangers of driving while black racism police brutality you know etc all of these things are not new you know but what is new is you know the widespread you know media coverage of it um you know these incidents being placed on our agenda uh and, and the cell know, phone videos exactly phone video. you know the the incidents being captured more and, and shared more um, but do you agree with, with that sentiment and, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's the cell phone video. I think, um, this has been going on for a long time. African-Americans being shot by police officers. Um, it's been happening The the interesting thing is the police officers were always in the past able to claim that it was either an accident or that the African-American person had. Um, you know, had started it or been violent. And yeah. now with the videos, the cell phone videos, everybody's got their own movie camera right there in their hand. And there's proof, there's evidence. I'm not sure that if there had not been a film of Derek Chauvin, if he mm -hmm. would have been convicted. I think oh, it yeah. was that film that made the case against him. Because you can see... George Floyd begging for his life. You can see George Floyd's, you know, you can see him kneeling on George Floyd's neck for absolutely no reason. Um, I think it's the video that convicted him. So in that sense, those cell phone videos have done um, an important service for African-Americans. Absolutely. Yeah. Same, same thing with the, with the Aubrey case, you know, we're yes. at for that video. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, we, we may not know who Ahmaud Aubrey is. Right. And today. you wouldn't know that he had done nothing 
wrong because the those those men would have said, well, he they, he attacked us. Yeah, yeah, and then you have the other cases like Trayvon Martin where there is no video, right? And if there was he video, and he got off, and mm-hmm. if there was video, everybody possibly could be viewing that case, Trayvon Martin Different. and George Zimmerman differently yeah. yes you know but i think that case in in particular as well as the ahmaud arbery one it there's so many parallels between what you were talking about early on in our talk with you about the slave catchers and the um patrols because george zimmerman i believe he called himself a neighborhood watchman right right yep um so just what what is it you're watching for are you watching for black people is that what you're doing or what is it you're watching for? People in hoodies? Yeah. 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 And a lot of times, many, many people like George Zimmerman or um, the individuals involved in the Ahmaud Arbery case have the instinct to protect their communities from outsiders, you know? So we, outsiders often meaning people who don't look like them. Mm. But it's just crazy to me to think that history you know all of these things are are still really really happening current day you know like there's not much that's different when we really look at at these cases right Um, and i and i think that's why african-americans especially african-american men have to be careful you know when they're traveling because you don't know how you'll be perceived in any particular community right but there is hope. Yeah. We just have to keep bending. We have to keep mm-hmm. bending. I love that. Um, That's that what quote we have from to you. Keep, yeah. keep bending it. Yes. <laughs> you, you have to. Yeah, you have to keep bending it. And to realize that we are just, you know, less than 100 years from the, the civil rights movement. Mm-hmm. You know, less, you know, it's been 400 years since since the beginning of, of slavery in this nation. So it, it hasn't been long. Yeah, um, yeah. So I guess it hasn't been long it. enough has been long enough long enough yeah <laughs> so yeah i think that's we touched upon a lot in this uh discussion uh professor soren and we really appreciate you for coming on um you're very you welcome know, you thanks explain. for having me it was fascinating yeah. great to meet you both <laughs> yeah we appreciate it um is there any anything else you want to you want to leave us with or um where can people find your works or, or buy your books well, they can find the book on Amazon or they can go to bookshop.org, which I love because it gives um, independent, it gives money to independent booksellers um, and it gives mm-hmm. money to black booksellers. So I, I say black uh, bookshop, bookshop.org or Amazon and they can get Driving While Black. Okay, okay. perfect. And how can I enroll in one of your classes? <laughs> oh boy! Maybe if I ever uh, decide to get my uh, PhD, <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll meet each other again. Exactly, yeah. that'd be wonderful. <laughs> Gretchen okay. Soren, thank you very Take much. Take care. Bye bye. Universe is long, but it bends towards us. Yep.